This is one of a series of Good Answers presentations, offering evidence to answer skeptical challenges to the Bible's accuracy. There are many, as you know, and skepticism can appear in many degrees. Some will limit themselves to questioning details of a narrative, such as whether Jesus healed a blind man on the way into Jericho or as he was leaving. Others will challenge the idea that he had healing powers at all, or any supernatural powers. But we sometimes find individuals who go all the way with their doubts and deny that Jesus ever lived. Today we look at one of these. On a website appropriately named No Beliefs, Jim Walker has this to say. No one has the slightest physical evidence to support a historical Jesus. No artifacts, dwelling, works of carpentry, or self-written manuscripts. All claims about Jesus derive from writings of other people. End quote. Well, that's quite an assertion. In response, one might appeal to Will Durant, whose 11 volume Story of Civilization has received more awards for excellence than one can count. In volume 3, page 557, he addresses this very point. Quote, In the enthusiasm of its discoveries, the higher criticism has applied to the New Testament tests of authenticity so severe that by them a hundred worthies, for example, Hammurabi, David, Socrates, would fade into legend. After two centuries of higher criticism, the outlines of the life, character, and teaching of Christ remain reasonably clear and constitute the most fascinating feature in the history of Western man." End quote. Durant obviously had little use for extreme skepticism of this sort, since it undermines the fundamental principles of historical study. Asking for artifacts and autograph works would indeed strip history of hundreds of names. We would lose Pericles, Alexander the Great, Hannibal, Tiberius Caesar, and even Joan of Arc. Incidentally, it's worth noting that, though not a Christian, Will Durant had profound respect for Jesus' importance in history. But let's take on this skeptic's challenge and see whether, even by Mr. Walker's own standards, Jesus' historicity can be proved. You recall that the Bible says Jesus was born in Bethlehem and that he was raised in Nazareth in Galilee. But not long into his public ministry, he abandoned Nazareth and established new headquarters. Matthew 4, 12 and 13 tells us, When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. End quote. But he didn't just stay in the town. John 6.59 mentions that he taught there. Quote, he said this while teaching in the synagogue of Capernaum. End quote. And he must have been doing miracles as well, because at one point he had very harsh words for this Galilean village. Quote, and you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens... No, you will go down to Hades, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. Matthew eleven twenty three. Yes, it's pretty clear that if Jesus lived anywhere throughout his ministry, it was in Capernaum. Well, where was that? Scholars don't know where every town from Jesus' day was, but we do know about this one. It was in northern Israel, located on the north shore 
of the Sea of Galilee. Its location has been known since at least the 1800s, and in 1895 the Franciscan Order purchased the property to protect it and carry out excavation. As you can see, they built a wall around the main portion of the town to keep out looters. That's what it looks like now, and archaeologists have learned enough from the ruins to provide us a good idea of how it would have looked in Jesus' day. Here is an architect's conception of the village. Notice the number of wharves, as you'd expect for a fishing village. Early on, investigators focused on the remains of a synagogue in the town. It was of special interest because of this passage from Luke chapter 7. Quote, when Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus, and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation, and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. Luke 7, 1-6 Do you recall how this went? When Jesus agreed to go to the soldier's home, the man objected, saying that it wasn't necessary. As one under authority and with authority over others, he knew the nature of command. Jesus need only say the word to accomplish the cure. And the Lord replied, I have not seen such faith in Israel. And that from a Roman. But did you notice what that passage said? The centurion had asked some of the town elders to carry his request, and they were happy to do so because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue real excitement then at the prospect that these ruins might be of the actual synagogue the scripture mentions. But no, the archaeologists all say otherwise. Israeli investigators date the building to the 2nd or 3rd century AD, since it has the same architectural style of other synagogues from that period. But the Italian archaeologists believe it is later, 4th or 5th century, based in part on a hoard of coins found under the building's floor. The nice thing about coins is that they can be dated by the emperor whose likeness they bear. That disagreement over the date continues to this day, but both parties agree on one thing. It's not a 1st century building. Well, the Franciscan friars kept digging, and in the 1960s they found something under the synagogue. Further work in 1981 confirmed that there was an earlier synagogue under the one we can see. Here's a false color photo that shows what they found. The light green is the floor of the more recent synagogue. Under it seen in gray here, was what they at first thought was a foundation. But at one corner they noticed that that foundation was not quite directly under the wall of the later building. What kind of foundation would that be? Then they found what we see in blue, a cobbled floor that had to be the floor of an earlier building, and the gray was no foundation it was what remained of its walls. An earlier building of the same dimensions and in the same style as the later one. Since synagogues were normally built on the highest point in town, and when replaced they were usually done in the same spot, it was not hard to deduce that this was an earlier synagogue, and this one from the first century A.D. 
Enough was found to reveal the floor plan of that early synagogue and to allow a reconstruction drawing of the building. As you see, it had two rows of internal columns, seats along one side for the elders, and an entrance facing Jerusalem. Most worshippers sat on mats on the floor, Eastern style. The principal archaeologist concluded, quote, This edifice, after thirteen years of patient labor of excavation and of recording, has been found appropriately under the area of the synagogue of the fourth or fifth centuries. We think, therefore, with all legitimacy, that the edifice of basalt walls excavated under the synagogue is properly the synagogue constructed in the first decades of the first century by that Roman centurion of whom Jesus said, Truly I say to you, neither in Israel have I found such faith. The idea that a Roman centurion might be associated with Capernaum was further confirmed when excavators found near the town a Roman-style bathhouse. Jews would not have built anything like this, nor would they have used it, but it provides evidence that there must have been a contingent of Roman soldiers stationed nearby. And if we look again at the center of Capernaum, we see an odd structure just 80 feet from the synagogue, out at the water's edge. Here is a closer view of it. What kind of building is that? Well, here's the floor plan, as the archaeologists exposed it. The three colors separate three periods of habitation. The light blue is the latest, then below it dark blue, and faint gray lines mark something older still. We'll have to look at these in turn. First, do you recognize this shape? That's right, an octagon. And a second, larger one. And a third, missing three of the eight sides, but clearly extending that pattern. The structure dates from the 5th century A.D., and a solid clue to its nature is right here. The largest octagon was not completed in order to leave room for an apse and a baptistry. No doubt about it, this building was a church. A church, fine, but oddly shaped. Why build a church in the shape of an octagon? The church historians come to our aid here. Quote, Octagonal churches were built to commemorate special events in Christian history, which supposedly occurred at the site. Presumably the octagonal church in Capernaum was intended to mark some other site of special importance in Christian history. End quote. Something special in Christian history. Let's look at what's under this building. Under the church what else but a house church? The building belongs to the 4th century A.D., used until it was replaced by that octagonal church. It was remodeled extensively over time, and graffiti on its walls say things like, Lord Jesus Christ, help thy servant, and Christ, have mercy. And we see crosses here and there, like this one. But do you remember that there was something even older than this? Here it is, a private home built in the first century AD. Cooking pots and other items make it clear that it was just that. But after about a century of occupation, a major change. The house was remodeled around the middle of the first century AD with special work done on the largest room, the central one. Now we see no more pottery fragments that speak of domestic use, and the walls and ceiling of the main room are plastered. 
Recall that lighting in antiquity was limited to little oil lamps, and so the illumination in interior rooms like this one would be quite dim. No problem for folks who live there. They know where everything is. But if numbers of visitors come in, they need to see. Plastering on walls and floor provide reflective surfaces to meet that need. But let the archaeologists tell you what they found. Quote, Both the plastering and the absence of pottery characteristic of family use combine to suggest that the room, previously part of a private home, was now devoted to some kind of public use. In view of the graffiti that mention Jesus as Lord and Christ in Greek, it is reasonable to conclude, though cautiously, that this may be the earliest evidence for Christian gatherings that has ever come to light. Wow! Did you catch that? The earliest evidence for Christian gatherings that has ever come to light. Now that is something to see, and something worth remembering. A scholar has given us a model of the house. Notice the thatched roof, necessary because the walls would not support a roof in wood or stone. But even so, it was perhaps the nicest house found yet in Capernaum, and right on the waterfront. The stone flooring had cracks here and there, and a few objects like this were found there, just about two inches long and in what should be a familiar shape. Recognize it? Recall that this was a fishing village. That's right, fish hooks. Let's put this together with special attention to the timeline. A private house is built in the first century BC. It remains a private home until around the middle of the first century AD, when it is remodeled for public use. White plaster brightens the central room to help congregants see, and graffiti adorn the walls. A house has become a house church, which continues to be remodeled over the second, third, and fourth centuries. Then, an octagonal church building is placed directly over it, a style of church that memorializes some important event in Christian history. Maybe we should consult one more passage from the Gospels. Quote, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. Mark 1, 29-31 That first century house was only about 80 feet from that first century synagogue, where Jesus often taught. Could this house then have been Peter's home, where Jesus often stayed? Well, we have a house that apparently belonged to a fisherman, converted a few years after Jesus' death and resurrection to a house church, and used for centuries until a memorial-type church is constructed over it. It was a memorial to something. What better deserved to be venerated in Capernaum than the home of the Apostle Peter, where Jesus had stopped? Let's return here at last to where we began. A skeptic publishes his doubts on the Internet. No one has the slightest physical evidence to support a historical Jesus. No artifacts, dwelling, works of carpentry, or self-written manuscripts. All claims about Jesus derive from the writings of other people. That's Jim Walker. Did a historical Jesus exist? But what do we see in Capernaum? The remains of the very synagogue where Jesus taught, 
and a few feet away, the house that served as his headquarters when he was in town. Pretty solid clues provided by archaeology. I think it would not be too unfair to say, Better do your homework, Jim. Don't you agree? If you have questions about this lecture, or any of the others in the Good Answers series, you may address them to me, Dr. Jerry C. 4, at yahoo.com.